right, so he knows the drill that you're going to do this first? Yeah, I'm just going to blow you for about five minutes. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can you hear? Sure. Welcome to 40 years of, or 40, 40 decades. Um, 40, um, 40 decades. Four, yeah. Four decades. It feels like it sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, I know nothing. Uh, I am the moderator today. Uh, and so we're going to do four decades of LPS. And, Introduce uh, yourself, Joe. We, we, uh, I am uh, artist Joe Phillips, uh, a longtime fan and friend of the bees, and here's Wendy, Yay. Yay. and Richard, Yay. so um, we're going to start off with a little presentation uh, from Richard, um, and so we're going to take it away now. Um, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, is, is he not splendiferous? <laughs> All right, uh, for 40 decades of ElfQuest. Uh, like I said 40 years, as opposed to, but yes, of course. It's 40, it's 40 years of pointed ears, we, we, we call that. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, how many of you in this room are, do not know what ElfQuest is, or who have not read ElfQuest? Have oh, we got some newbies? Okay. Uh, ElfQuest is a, um, we started in 78, so 2018 was our 40th anniversary, and we wrapped up a major story arc at that time. Um, feels like 40 decades. Jeez, wow. Uh, you know, some seven or 8,000 pages, most of which she did, uh, and uh, hundreds and hundreds of issues of the comics, and... Um, the most recent series was called Final Quest, and fans wondered, what, well, final, that sounds final, they said, that means no more Elf Quest. And, um, no, there's more Elf Quest. Um, if you don't know much about it, you can go to ElfQuest.com and catch up. But we're going to be talking about some stuff here. Uh, it might be a little bit spoilery, but, you know, that's, that's the choice you take when you come into this room. Um, <laughs> There were, there were four collected volumes of Final Quest. Uh, the story is mostly about Cutter, who's the chief of the Wolf Riders, but not all about Cutter, because there's another major character who is Cutter's brother in all but blood, and his name is Skywise. And the two of them have a very, very special relationship, and have all throughout the story and, and all throughout um, all of their years uh, together, uh, they are as close as two friends can be. Uh, at the end of Final Quest, and, and anyone who's in a relationship knows that relationships can be tempestuous. So it's not all uh, sweetness and light between them. Uh, at the end of Final Quest, Cutter's storyline, Cutter's journey was resolved. Uh, but Skywise's wasn't, and that's what uh, we're here partly to talk about today. Skywise has some stuff he still has to go through before his story is completed. And um, so now, that's what uh, we're telling in the current series, which is ElfQuest Stargazer's Hunt. Um, Stargazer's Hunt is mostly about Skyways, but not all about Skyways. And just to give you a very quick uh, recap, at the very, very end of Final Quest, Skywise finally was able to get together with his destined life mate, Timane. This is a, a double page panel uh, from the last <coughs> issue of Final Quest, and Wendy was very, very sneaky and uh, way up in a corner in, in the sky, uh, she gave a hint as to what was happening. And if you zoom in on that, it's Skywise and Timane and their newborn <coughs> daughter, who's named Jink. If you know about ElfQuest, uh, you, know you know that Jink has been a character in the future of ElfQuest for a bunch of stories. 
<laughs> um, we, we sort of spun off uh, a future series of ElfQuest called Future Quest, and Jink played and plays a large part in that, but a lot of people, you know, what's her origin, what's her story? And we're taking the opportunity in Stargazer's Hunt to, uh, to talk about that, because Jink is born at the end of Final Quest and grows up in Stargazer's Hunt. She is growing up as the uh, issues progress. Uh, and then there's another character that people are having fun with, we're having a lot of fun with, because at the very end of Final Quest, Cutter and Lita had another cub. And uh, you saw a shot of him at the very end of Final Quest. And the first thing that everybody wanted to know is, what's his name? <laughs> what's his name? What's Cutter and Lita's new cub's name? And we deliberately did not tell you. Somebody suggested Chad. <laughs> <laughs> because he's blonde and he's hunky and he's, he's all of that. Um, and we've just taken that and run with it, and, and obviously it must be his name. Yeah, he, he does have a real name, and we're going to reveal that any issue now. Um, as I said earlier, if you're coming in and all you remember of ElfQuest is the original 20 issues from 78 to 84, you have missed a lot. There's a lot of catching up for you to do, but luckily you can do it painlessly. Go to ElfQuest.com, which is the official ElfQuest website. Uh, you click on that little button up there that says Read Online. You click that button and you're going to be taken to the front door of our online library archive. And there's 35 years of ElfQuest that I scanned and loaded up there. So you can read it for free. And Yes, thank you. Um, it's far more important to me as a co-creator and as a publisher that readers discover ElfQuest without having to seek out and pay exorbitant prices for back issues than it is to make a dime online. I mean, I, I don't care about that. I want people to read it. Anyway, uh, Stargazer's Hunt. The newest series is up and running. The first issue appeared um, this past November. Uh, the second issue came out in January. And issue number three, you will find in less than a week uh, at fine comic shops everywhere or go to darkhorse.com. And um, you can get it there, either paper or digitally as well. And with that, um, I've got my uh, little sort of quick Cliff's Notes catch up. And uh, when we found out that Joe was going to moderate this, we said, Joe, you have free reign to take whatever kind of shots you want. <laughs> uh, Joe's outrageous, and we're looking for some outrageousness. So take it away. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure how, much, how outrageous I'm going to be, but. I'm going to start off with a little personal story, if you don't know, mind. Um, uh, the first time I met uh, them was at uh, Atlanta Fantasy Fair many eons ago. And I, you know, was a little, uh, I believe that, a little uh, younger uh, artist with my little drawings and whatnot. And uh, they did things differently in the South. They had this um, sort of uh, costume contest, meet the artists, kind of uh, uh, event. So they would put you all down in, 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 uh, on stage, and everybody would come out, and they would say you know, who they were. And so uh, Wendy uh, came out, and um, this was the year that I think you did your uh, Red Sonya costume. At Atlanta Fantasy Fair. Atlanta Fantasy Fair, yeah. I, I might have still been doing it, yeah. but that's, that's pre-Elf Quest. That's, that, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. uh, uh, it was 
it was just stunning. And you know, I'm just sitting there going like, I want to make cool costumes like that. <laughs> and um, really? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Really? I mean, I, I made costumes, but you know, I, I you don't want to say how old I was, but I was, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I. Just, I didn't know what I was doing. I would, I would make a costume, and it was like, "Hey, look, I'm, you know, this stupid character." And uh, but <laughs> the attention to detail is what really got me. From the boots to all the little pieces of the chain, the hair, everything was perfect. Uh, you know, she she she, she cut a, a a great figure on stage. So every so it was just you know it was the talk of the show. You know, no matter what side of the ball you played. It was, the talk, it was the talk, you know, it was the talk of the show, so, and then the fact that she could draw too, I was like, wow, because at the time, you know, most of the girls were drawing really girly things, and she wasn't, she was drawing cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> what? Well, you were. You were like, <laughs> so girly things are not cool. No, I'm not saying they're not cool. Look, I, I'm I'm going back into my, you know, like I wasn't I wasn't elevating back then. I wasn't woke, you know. <laughs> uh, I was a stupid kid. I go like, girls doll, like, you know, like flowers than deers, you know. And that was, you know, and that was most of the, you know, so. Uh, I don't, I don't want to name the date when year this was, but this was this was a while back. And um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Richard was there, and uh, Richard's eyes are like lasers. They're just like these. They, they were they were like super bright blue, just like you know. Yeah. And so they were together, and we're like, wow, these people are the coolest people in the entire world. So that's my personal story. <laughs> um, uh, cut two years later, and uh, Elfquest uh, is here. And so, one of the things before I get into you know the specifics of ElfQuest, I want to do a little history. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have a wonderful story of how you met. Do you guys know how they met? No. Some do. Some do. Okay, Some so don't. you know, but you don't. But you don't read the book. So that's interesting. I like that. Well, I, I read my first issue of ElfQuest last night. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, that's a newbie, newbie. Awesome. Right. <laughs> Well, now you, you got tucked into it, like you're in the deep end now. You're just yeah. watching all this stuff happen. Oh, yeah. yeah, so you get to so, so you get to go delve back in, you know, peel the orange and go back in and see what's all there. Um, By the way, I, I just want to jump in and say, don't worry, I don't have coronavirus. You've seen me coughing. <laughs> I, I, I happen to be especially sensitive to blowy air conditioning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that seems to be all this freaking hotel does. Yeah. <laughs> so I have been half cough, half cough yeah. the whole time. And dry. people are like, <laughs> <laughs> Which is I'm, not always a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not contagious. Please please don't worry if I cough. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you're hinting at. And that's why I'm sitting over here. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I am joking. No. Well, no. You're hinting that. We should tell that story. Yes. Uh, well, I would, or you tell this. No, well, I don't want to tell the story. It's your story. We want you are, to tell the story. Can your voices? Yes. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, uh, from what I can remember, uh, Wendy wrote um, uh, a letter to... Um, Silver Surfer Sil number I'm five. I'm getting it. To Silver, Sur <laughs> Silver Surfer number five. <laughs> and uh, uh, she was like, uh, it was a very... Intense letter, uh, and the boys who saw this letter they went nuts because you know what is it like? You say it's like three, four girls that even read comic books, and so uh, back this in the day, 1969. So oh. back in the day, yeah, uh, I was, I don't, you know, I was Baby Yoda at the time, uh, <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> but my powers were very really weak. Uh, so, uh, but what, what happened is, you know, all these boys, of course, are, uh, are going to write her because they are excited. And the thing is, uh, you know, they would actually put your address yep. in the letters column so strangers from nowhere could just write you. Uh, it was a different time. And uh, <laughs> so I can imagine Wendy getting, you know, boxes that the mailman just keep showing up with, 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 with letters. And they all have, you know, say what they say because who can imagine what the young uh, prepubescent or pubescent boys unwoke uh, adolescent. Adolescent, <laughs> adolescent boys, yes, you know, and they didn't even have a picture. So if they had a picture, they probably would have like, you know, 
you know, freaked out. You know, um, but all but, I needed was a girl's name. Yeah, that's all yeah, it took. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and and Richard was one of those boys. <laughs> okay, <I'm just> <laughs> and uh, he sent uh, a letter, and for whatever reason, fate. Do you uh, want to know the reason? Oh, tell me, yeah, tell okay. the reason. Yeah. See, because my mother was very impressed with this because she would pick me up at high school, we'd go to the uh, mailbox and, and uh, it would be, you know, full of letters from these guys. And she, <laughs> she was like, she was kind of leery of this until one letter came in with the return address MIT. And m my mother's eyes lit up with dollar signs. <laughs> And she said, answer that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's the best part of the story. <laughs> I like mama already. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so, you know, of course, uh, she answered the letter, and I guess you guys wrote a couple of times, mm -hmm. and then there was like a, and then uh, they exchanged phone numbers, if I'm not mistaken. Exchanged photos, and then... Oh, photos. Oh, okay. Photos. So, oh, so you got to see the blue eyes. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, did you have red hair at the time? Mm -hmm. Did you have red hair at the time? Oh no, I've never had red hair. Well, I mean, well, when I first met you, you had red hair. The red, the red, and, and, and I am red, green, colorblind, so it can oh. be any color. Right. <laughs> you know, I, no. I would not know. No, I am the mousiest brown. It's pitiful. Oh. Just pitiful. But I do things with it. I like the best. So. Anyway, so. Uh, uh, Thing happened, and uh, Richard called, and, and and he's like, "Guess who this is?" And she's like, "At the time," <laughs> you know, and she starts rattling off all these names of people that she would know. And I, yeah, I can only imagine Richard's on the other floor and go like, "Oh God, <laughs> yeah, it's me, Richard." You have to you have to picture a freshman inside a pay phone booth inside a dormitory, oh. sinking lower and lower. <laughs> oh. Insanity. And, uh, <laughs> and, and magic happened from there. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, so uh, you guys can tell what happened next. Well, let me tell you about his letter. Do you, you want to know why I answered the yeah, letter? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Because all these other guys told me what comics they liked, how many pimples they had. You know, they just <laughs> oh. they they were quite adolescent. This one writes me a letter and says, I really liked what you had to say in your letter that got printed in the Silver Surfer, but if you want to know more about me, you have to write to me, and I promise you, surprises await. Oh. So, you see, he was very clever. He was the only one who intrigued me. Nice. You see. Smooth moves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was practicing my marketing moves. For <laughs> <laughs> you got to start somewhere. So, um, so that's the story. Yeah. So um, after that, I guess you guys uh, met at, at some point. Well, you have to understand, I'm living in the dorm in Boston, Massachusetts. She's in Los Angeles. Oh, so wow. There is a continent between us. And so oh, we're, wow. we're, we're pen palling it. Uh, cross country, and and finally, uh, I made the decision, and, and she aided and abetted. Uh, he lied to his parents. We had to meet. <laughs> wow. There was no way my parents were going to let a 19-year-old drive cross country. So I thought I convinced <laughs> them that I was taking a writing seminar at some school in Pennsylvania which was okay to go to, because that was only a couple states away. And instead, I got into my little car, and I drove in two and a half days cross-country to Los Angeles. Wow. To meet the her. And you, and, 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 and you'd never been to Los Angeles before? No, I don't think I had. Wow. No. But I, I had an address, because she was going to college, to Claremont Colleges, so I knew where that was. I could find it on a paper map. <laughs> no such a GPS. No GPS. Decades, wow. decades in the future, mm -hmm. and I found her dorm, and I, I had the good sense before I got to the dorm to stop at a motel and shower <laughs> <laughs> because I've been in the car for two and a half days, <laughs> night and day, just driving. And we met, and it was one of those slow motion Clairol ads. 
Uh, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Amazing. And see, and, and the reason I, I like that story because it shows the depth of the connection, which I think comes through in the depth of the connection that the characters have because it's sort of based on the reality of, you know, they say you write what you know. Yes. And, you know, that happens. Now, we're going to skip a little bit. Uh-oh. Well, just a little bit. Uh, 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 to your art as an artist, because that's, that was the thing that attracted me to the book in the first mm-hmm. place. Uh, I love elves, uh, uh, you, know, I, you know, The Hobbit and all of this kind of good stuff. So, uh, not Keebler elves, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, I like Keebler elves. And I was really surprised a few years ago, <laughs> this is really weird, but they had a little black elf and she like cook, makes some uh, new cookies and I'm going like, look at you. Yeah. Keebler elves. About time. About time. <laughs> you know, so she's making some cookies up in there. I'm like, but of course they were like some kind of fudge cookies or something. So I was like, yeah, I get you. But anyway. Um, black elf ma- making fudge? I don't know. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I don't know. If there's somebody in marketing, they thought they were being real clever. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, but, um, so, what? You got me sidetracked. So why, why you put uh, an elf of color in there? And I put a whole well, tribe. Right, but, you know, it started. <laughs> okay, look, look. <clears throat> I grew up in Gilroy, California. Mm. I had never met a black person. Our brown people were the Latinos, the, the, the migrant workers, you know. And my father ran a ranch on which migrant workers were used every year to do work. And I loved to hang out with them, but I had the kind of parents who did not want me to hang out with them. <laughs> and I, I, I dated a Latino boy when I was 14, but they found out, Uh-oh. and boy, boy, I caught hell. But so that was, it was that kind of family. So I'm all the more attracted to what's different to what's, you know, like, I, I see more family in these people. I used to, as a little kid, I used to run out into the orchard where the, mm-hmm. where the migrant workers were uh, cooking, like cooking their right. lunches. Right. And they were really nice to me and they would like give me tortillas and I fell in love with tortillas. Oh, wonderful. And, and they were so kind to me and they were, they, they seemed to me to know more about family than my family. Sure, yeah, I mean, family so, shouldn't have put breaks on it. It should just be, yeah. you know, you just accept everybody in. But, but needless to say, I was not encouraged to hang out with them, so that made it all the more interesting. So, so as time progressed and, and you know, we got into ElfQuest and we knew we were going to have different kinds of tribes and we wanted them to represent different that kinds was of very, people. That was very exciting. Um, yeah. you know, even though I did the first books, I saw they were black and white, mm. but you know you can tell uh, the way you guys have did it, and it just was it was really nice to see dark colored elves, and I was like really excited by that. Well, and that hadn't really been done before. No, it had that it, time. It, it really hadn't. You know, and it's mm. sort of like you know like you know there are no black people in history. There are no black <laughs> elves. And they're like I don't know why not. You know, if, well, they, can, if they can come in green, they can come in other colors. Yeah. They sure can. And the sun folk were meant to represent a variety of different cultures, like Aztec, right. Middle Eastern, African, uh, Egyptian. They're mm-hmm. all they're a combination of all of those. Right. You know, but you figure, you know, they they adapted to a, a climate, a desert climate. Right. Of so course, the sun, yeah. sunlight, and everything. And, yeah, I mean, it, it, and uh, it's going to happen. <laughs> But, but, especially these days, uh, uh, people will, will come up and say, uh, you were so ahead of your time in putting characters of color in there, but that's not why you did it, to, no. you know, for quota or anything like that. You have told me. No, I did it for color because I go nuts when I see turquoise and coral next to golden brown. Mm-hmm. And it gave me an excuse to put turquoise and coral and lime green and all those colors next to golden brown, right. which as an artist, just I go, oh. <laughs> you know. But, 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 so. the, but the thing is, the, the innocence of that, I think, is something that makes Elf Quest very special, is because it isn't about quotas. It isn't about, oh, let's have some gay characters. Oh, let's have some black characters. Oh, let's have some, you know, bullies. Let's have some, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's an organic 
read for for because I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm a, I'm a very bad reader. I'll read a, a series and then I'll put it down for uh, a couple of months and then I'll come back and when I have like two or three because I, I like to read like two or three at a time as opposed to uh, episodic because I have a very terrible memory. Uh, so that was one of the things I always liked. Um, you know, there were so many uh, levels that would come up and, and ideas and I'm like, wow, I wouldn't have not, you know, I would not have gone that way. But when you guys came up with, of course, so you're, you're drawing, you know, your regular material. Now, how did you make the connection between you uh, working with, in writing, but you were a writer and creator yourself, so how, because like in relationships it's always very difficult to um, work together and, and, and relate together without, I don't want to say the ego, but, but that, that you know, I think that's know, appropriate. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, with the, with, you know, with, with the ego because sometimes, you know, people are at different levels and also those levels change, so sometimes the writing is strong in one direction and, and, and sometimes the art is strong in another direction and people, I know people are very um, um, visually stimulated and so, uh, you know, would, you know, the fans, you know, be more excited by the artist and less by the writer or then there's some people who are very literary and they think that the, the artist just draws whatever the writer comes up with. So that kind of uh, input from um, an outside source, how does that you know, fit in into you guys' creative process. How, how how have you learned to work with that? What were you, some of your 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 demons in dealing with that? If there were any. If there were any. Huh. <laughs> uh, all right. So, which of those twelve questions do you have to tackle first? <laughs> I, had to, I had to think. No, he, he pointed out two yeah. things that are really important: is um, working together, and how did we parse out the working together, and two. How did uh, reaction from the outside affect how we work together? Did I get it? You got, you got okay. close okay. enough for, for uh, ranch work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's a rancher's girl. Uh, <laughs> let me take a step further back and say that the, that the basic idea for ElfQuest is Wendy's because she's been a storyteller all her life. And she has told many, many stories in different ways, but they all have a thread in common, and that is a group of characters or a character who are outsider and who are looking for safety, who are looking for family, looking for community, looking for tribe, looking for safe haven. And of course, that is the, the driving bedrock uh, of, of ElfQuest, because the Wolf Riders especially, they're very much outsiders when we first meet them. So she, she's, she brought all that to us. Um, we'd been married for a few years, and uh, she sat me down in 77 and said, I have an idea, how do we, how do we make it happen? In 77, Star Wars came out, and suddenly the world was very receptive to science fiction fantasy, where previous to that, it was weird stuff, and you were geeky if you liked it, but now everybody liked it, so it was okay. Uh, she sat me down, told me this, the, the basic plot, and I said, I love it, let's do it. Uh, and we settled upon the format of comics, because we were both comics fans. Also, comics would give her art a chance to shine. Now, she brought her own storytelling sensibilities to it, and that's, again, the foundation of ElfQuest. I, as a writer, came up through a slightly different uh, path. I'd been working uh, at the Planetarium in Boston as a writer of their star shows. And it's a different skill set. You have to love the language and you have to know how to put a sentence together, but it's a different way of looking at condensing things because you've only got a certain amount of time or editing things or making things consistent. I think what I brought to, to her massive <laughs> fantasy creativity was a kind of nuts and bolts um, editing style yeah. and, and a grounding. We wanted this to be a, a more scientific, pseudo-scientific than just pure fantasy where you could wave a wand and suddenly you get what you want. There had to be reasons for stuff. I think that's mm -hmm. one answer. Yeah, uh, uh, if there's magic in ElfQuest, it's all energy manipulation, it's all telekinetic. It's all within the realm of the possible, and when they communicate telepathically, 
Well, that's also, you know, you, you've seen that on Star Trek with Mr. Spock, you know, it just, it's, it's stuff that we didn't want to go much farther into the woo-woo, you know, we, we wanted to keep it believable, and we didn't think much about who our audience was going to be when the first issue was released. We really just wanted to tell the story, and we thought maybe this was going to be a little hobby, and we'd go for four or five issues. And, well, I mean, you, you, you want to tell what happened? Yeah, please tell us. We're all excited. What, what, what? No, no, no. Yeah, like, yeah. I, when he says it, it means something different from. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be a publisher. Uh, I knew nothing about marketing, uh, printing, distribution, any of that stuff. I wanted to find somebody to whom we could send the the art boards, and they would send us money. And, you know, very simple calculus. I like it. Uh, we took it to Marvel DC, a couple of independents, and they all said, no, nah, it's too peculiar, it's, it's just too weird. Um, yeah, other people get, you know, this is not up to our standards, or this sucks. We got, this is too peculiar. We heard that from both companies. You know, they had never seen anime manga influenced artwork before they didn't even know what anime or manga was it was it was just beginning to come into western consciousness back because then because wendy knew about anime and manga probably before most everyone else in the country because she grew up near san francisco and was exposed to the trickle of manga coming out of japantown in san francisco at the time nobody else knew this style anyway um so I said, okay, we're going to do it, and I didn't know any better. I, uh, there were 10,000 copies printed of the first issue, and they sold out inside of two months. Now, we both came from like a fanzine tradition where you did 50 copies, you did 100 copies. Uh, there were a very few independent comics at the time. I don't know the numbers but I suspected they weren't in that ring. All that aside, the first run of 10,000 copies sold out, blew our minds. So I tried 20,000 for issue number two, that sold out. I said, okay, 40,000 for issue number three, that sold out. I said, we got something here. Well, it was catching light, lightning in a bottle because the field was wide open and uh, there was plenty of room on the shelves for new material. And people were starting to look for something different from superhero comics. It just was, we were just in the right place at the right time. I doubt it could be done again. Yeah, that, but that's that, what that, happened. that was one of the things when I started picking, picking up, because like the stuff I was watching, um, we, I used to live in Atlanta, and they had, um, I think Turner uh, bought like, all these old TV stations, and he would play... Uh, uh, the manga. Uh, uh, so he had like it was Speed Racer and Kemba the White yes. Lion and uh, a lot of Tezuka, Astro Boy. Astro Boy, all of this stuff. So I so I was very well acquainted with that style. And when I saw the Wolf Riders, and I was just like, oh, you know, thinking like I'm getting something in that in that vein. And you know, it just was that that feel. Uh, I didn't really know it as manga at the time, but I but I. But I, but I could connect, make that connection. So, uh, so some of your influences are, are influences that, uh, you know, the zeitgeist at the time was 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 not, uh, was opening up to that, and you just caught this this uh, fresh wave, and uh, just it exploded. Um, on an artistic side note, what are some of your influences when you? You, when, when you create it, because they are, not only is the story a very unique story, um, but what it has is it instantly transports you to a place. Um, and that, uh, you know, it in itself, because like when you look at superhero comics, I mean, they, you know, it, you know, Marvel characters look a certain way, DC characters look a certain way, but you can still put them together and they look similar. But your stuff was its own uh, feel and uh, your uh, panel dynamics 
were not the traditional square, 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 yeah. square. There was round panels and there were panels that jutted into each other and uh, it had uh, a movement. So what, what were some of your uh, biggest influences? In that? I, I'm a child of two senseis. My western sensei is Jack Kirby and my eastern sensei is Osamu Tezuka, creator of Astor Boy, Kimba, Phoenix, you know. And um, what Jack gave me was a sense of structure, a sense of power, a sense of giving weight and substance and movement, you know, dynamic movement to your characters. What Tezuka gave me was he had this incredibly deceptive, childlike drawing style. His, if you remember Astro Boy, you know, with the great big eyes and, you know, the very childlike, cartoony style. And he would design these characters and then put them through the worst shit you ever <laughs> I mean, he would... And the, the first anime that made it to America in 1961 was called Alakazam the Great, and Tezuka was oh, one of the directors. Yeah. Everybody remembers Alakazam yeah. the Great. And it was America's first exposure to anime. Um, and then later on, and very shortly after that, the, the Speed Racer and those TV series started happening. So I'm 10 years old. I go to the movies on a Saturday afternoon. I see this thing that destroys my mind. Because up to that point, I thought animation was about Disney. I thought it was fairy tales and pretty princesses and everything went happily ever after. Here comes Alakazam the Great and there's blood. Characters are killing each other. You know, there's monsters, there's dragons, there's horrible jeopardy. The hero gets badly injured and, you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> you can do that with cartoons? You know, and I, be I began madly, you know, sketching out this style of artwork. That's what, that was my first exposure to Amazing. it. Amazing, yeah. Well, but, yeah. I mean, and and that, that joy has not, you know, you know, diminished through the projects that I've seen the, the joy of putting characters through the worst. Well, yeah, no, but I, I, think that's what, I think that's what, I think that's what, you know, like, uh, you know, like, if someone just casually picked up the book and they flip through it and they see these characters with these bright faces and, and, and pleasing shapes, mm -hmm. they may not, you know, uh, know what's going to happen and they start reading and they start finding out, you know, characters are being, uh, you know, going through stuff. Finding out that these characters don't like each other, these characters, you know, the humans are, are attacked. You know, it's, it's like it's like so multi-layered, and you get this really sense of of, of high adventure, and uh, but it seems very familiar. Um, so one of the things that uh, it, in the in the four decades that you you know that you've taken to tell the story with the side tracks and stuff like some of this, I remember when when I first learned about the. Uh, star connections with ever with the characters and that like blew my mind because I'm you know I'm coming from the, the world of you know Dungeons and Dragons and thinking that well elves are part of Dungeons and Dragons and they, you know and then there's the star connection and you're like oh my god this is so cool I was not expecting that you know so so that uh, you, know, you know how do you maybe how do you but, but, but when you when you're working are you do you already have this plan now or is it something that as you, as you go you start uh, uh, discovering things about the characters that you did not know before or that you um, hinted at and then all of a sudden they've had time to gestate? That was an or question and the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Break it down. <laughs> no, uh, as I said back in 1977, Wendy gave me the basic plot skeleton for ElfQuest and uh, being the archivist that I am, I have all the notes that we made from those times, and uh, I, I go through them and uh, discover, wow, you know, things have changed. The, the, the basic thing was there, but ElfQuest was originally going to be shorter than it turned out to be, because as we sat down and developed these things, just as you asked, uh, a character would discover, uh, win a will. Winnowill's our favorite bad girl. Um, she was going to be a more minor character. Uh, yeah. And when she came onto stage, suddenly she just owned the world. She took over, and 
We needed another three, four, five issues to properly tell her story. Yes, so she, she inspired a lot of cosplay. She actually did. Yeah, she had a panel, you know, where, where she's standing there, and you know, they have the, the, the outfit, and it, it's like, where did she come from? Because you know, everybody else is all small, and she's all, you know, she's oh, yeah. grand, mm -hmm. and uh, got this arrogant look on her face of like, how dare you? You know, I think, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But, Another thing that happens, and sometimes the characters in the situation will take over and grow, uh, sometimes we'll have discussions. She wants a, a story to go one way, I think it might go another way, we'll have some words about that. Uh, and we'll discover a third way that's better than either of the other two, but it wants more space than either of the other two. But there's one more element. What Wendy particularly likes to do, and what I'm, I'm learning how to do from her, is there are a lot of tropes in fantasy, there are a lot of cliches in fantasy, and what ElfQuest loves to do is to take a cliche that you've all become familiar with and turn it on its ear. And the example, one of the examples we like to use is, okay, at the very beginning, Cutter this wild little barbarian wolf rider storms into the Sun Village, picks up Lita and throws her over her shoulder. That's what Conan would do, that's what any of the muscle, you know, male uh, characters would do. And very quickly, Lita turns the tables and puts him right in his place. So, you have, you show the trope first, you show the behavior first, and then you have another character go, nah, -uh, no this way. Mm -hmm. And ElfQuest is full of that. And I think that's another thing that makes it kind of really different from most other uh, storytelling. Sub subversive. Subversive. Yeah. Sneaky. Yeah. You can all, you know, the, the thing I think I like is that there's actual um, uh, movement, whereas like a lot of characters you, you'll follow along with them, and then, but because of their their licensing potential, they have to return to neutral um, at some point, and so you don't get that sense of growth, and you don't get to see the kids grow up. I mean, Franklin Richards has been what six forever, yeah. you know that kind of a thing, and 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 you're kind of you know so so I you know I think that the the idea of a quest and looking for something, um, where does that connection come from you? Are, are you guys, are you looking for something? In other words, uh, the because the elves... Royalty checks. Yeah, royalty <laughs> checks. <laughs> because, because the elves are on this this decade-spanning quest, what, right. what sort of quest will we on? Yeah, what kind of quest were you... Uh, you Meeting know. deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> true. Well, I mean, you were doing everything, at, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, we've always been the little red hen. But in, in a larger, more spiritual sense, said at the beginning, ElfQuest is full of characters who are seeking togetherness. To, uh, uh, it's an inclusive kind of story. Some um, of our, our fans have said it best. They say they think of ElfQuest as a self-quest. That's very really cool. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and we never set out, especially 40 years ago, to do a story that would be more relevant today in terms of, come on people, it's better if we live yeah, yeah. in harmony than divisive, uh, but it seems more relevant today than it was in 77 when we started in 78. I, I don't mind telling you that when we started in 77, you know, just still riding the wave of the hippie, uh, you know, bell bottoms, Woodstock, <laughs> you know, the whole thing, fringe, and the elves just kind of fit right into that <laughs> milieu. <laughs> and we were, we dealt with themes in the story of, of prejudice, uh, fear. Um, Elf Quest has never been about good versus evil, it's been about uh, fear versus, versus not, uh, ignorance and knowledge and the battle between the two and, and how knowledge can conquer. Um, that's, that's the way to win, not, not with bloodletting, but by learning, right. you know. Uh, and so that, that was a constant theme for us, but believe me, when we were working with those themes back in 77, we thought for sure 
that by now it would be different. But. It would be different. We were supposed to have flying cars, <laughs> and every everybody was supposed to be all over all that stuff, and we couldn't be more astonished to be plunged back 50 years. I, we never thought this would happen. But here we yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, I mean, one of the things I think, and especially when you go to the website to uh, please stop now. <laughs> um, You're kidding. You got a minute. No. Finish that thought. I, I, I was, I was going to say. We don't have time for Q&A or anything? No. Okay. It's okay. All right. Well, okay. uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. I mean, we can talk forever because Lord knows I can get up. Uh, this information is just, is, is this, uh, hopefully, there's been some information that is not just um, surfacey, but you actually get to understand the creators uh, who put this together and why it's so important. You can go back to the website and read the old issues. They are just as relevant when they were written as they are now. Um, and you can find yourself within those pages of those stories. We're on Facebook, elfquest.com, and we have a table in the dealer's room out in the pavilion there. If you have questions that you couldn't ask here, come by. We'll mm. be happy to continue this conversation there. But thank you very much, all of you, for coming and visit us today. Yeah, here. we could have done another hour easy. easy thank easy. you. <laughs>